Okay, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. We have a really special panel tonight to talk about uh, optimizing your sales selection under ORC. We're gonna go ahead and get right into it and introduce our three guests that have joined us tonight. Uh, joining us tonight, I have Steve Benjamin, who a lot of people have probably heard of either um, on the Regatta leaderboard or in various articles in the last couple decades. He's a multiple Etchells, national, multiple Etchells world champion, national champion, North American champion. He's an Olympic silver medalist in the 470. He's won a Rolex Yachtsman of the Year, and he currently works out of North Sales in Miami. Um, John Bowden, who's joining us from North Sales Charleston, has been sail making for 26 years. He's been with North Sales for eight years and he has 16 national championships in various classes. And then our guest tonight from outside of North Sales is Robert Rosenbach. Robert is a naval architect, aerodynamicist, and lifelong sailor. He has been involved in science and engineering of sail and motor yacht performance in various capacities for many years. At the moment, he sails a Viper with his wife and is a member of the ORC International Technical Committee, where he contributes to continual improvement of the ORC Velocity Prediction Program. So we really thank Robert for joining us tonight and taking time out of his schedule to answer some of our questions and some of your questions as well. Uh, so kind of what we're going to discuss tonight is we're going to talk about what is ORC. A lot of people might be new to the rule and they want to know why it's different, why it's different from maybe PHRF or IRC. Uh, we're going to talk about what sales that you have to measure in for the ORC rule. We're going to talk about everyone's favorite hot topic right now, which is headsail set flying. So that's code zeros, tweeners, those sorts of sales that people like to add to their boats. Uh, we're going to talk about how to match your inventory to your intended racing under the ORC rule. And then finally, we'll go through what is on an ORC certificate, because there's a lot of information. And I think many of us, including myself, have a general idea of what's on the certificate, but there's a lot more involved. And Robert's here to kind of point out what all of the different numbers mean and what they're used for. And then finally, we're going to go to how do you get your sales measured with North Sales? Uh, as well at the very end. Yes, Steve. Uh, sorry, I want to just add one thing to my credentials, if I may, that I am one of three U.S. congressmen to the ORC. Uh, I'm the original uh, still standing U.S. congressman uh, that still attends the meetings. They're held once a year. During COVID, we held them virtually. Um, this year, I think we're having them in Tuscany, so that's not bad duty. Uh, but I have been doing that since 2013, and I'm quite familiar with the whole ORC process and fully supportive of it and representing the U.S. now with two other congressmen because we've grown. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Robert to talk about what is ORC and why is it different than other rating rules out there. Thanks, Austin. So um, ORC, uh, the rating system, uh, actually relies on really two significant components. One is the, the measurement process, which is described as, as part of the international measurement system. And then the velocity prediction program, where we actually take those measurements and do speed predictions of the boats um, so that we can keep track of the different characteristics, more sail area, less uh, displacement, those kinds of things. Um, we generally have two kinds of certificates. We have the, the ORC International Certificates. That's where the boats are completely measured. Um, and in that case, you actually have to have a very detailed definition of the hull. And also you have to uh, incline the boat and get the overhang. So there's an in the water measurement as well as measuring the rig and uh, your sails. Um, because it's, that's a difficult process and, and it takes some time, um, we also offer uh, ORC club certificates where you don't have all the same measurements and some of the measurements may be declared by the owner or the, uh, the rating office will decide them based on available information in the, uh, in the fleet. Um, and so, uh, and we get those certificates. Those certificates, generally speaking, uh, are uh, designed ex to be uh, to give you sort of a worse rating because we want people to measure the boats and get a proper one. And so when we, when we make those defaults or those estimates of those measurements, 
the boat will look lighter and be more stable probably than a boat that got measured. So it really behooves you to uh, get the ORC international certificate and go through that, uh, that effort. Um, and then I just wanted to really stress that, um, you know, we will try to go through some of the things about ORC, but there's a lot more information out there. And the ORC website that's listed here and the U.S. sailing website in the section devoted to ORC is a wealth of information that's available for all of you to look at uh, at your earliest opportunity. Yes, Steve. Sorry, um, I'm getting text messages that uh, there were participants trying to get in and they have a meeting number, but no password. How should I answer that? Uh, are they calling in or are they coming in through Zoom? Um, I could tell them to enter through Zoom. Yeah, I'd enter through Zoom if, if possible. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, for everyone else listening, if they have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat box and we'll either get to them as we can throughout the talk or at the very end of the talk, we'll try and address some of the questions that you guys might have as well. Thanks. So Robert, if you wanna continue on here? You bet. Um, so um, the question is, you know, why, what is it about ORC that makes it uh, worthwhile considering? Um, there are really essentially three pillars to ORC. Uh, first is the science. Um, it's an objective process. Uh, it uses science um, to do the velocity predictions. It's actually literally a physics-based force balance, and it's overseen by technical experts in the field. We have yacht designers, sail makers, um, all different kinds of people looking at it. Um, and the intent through this process is to produce the fairest rating between boats, and also to try to the maximum extent practical avoid type forming. Um, we also, transparency is a really important attribute of ORC. There are no secret factors. Um, the VPP itself is published. There's documentation about exactly how the VPP works, and it's available to download from the, uh, the website. There's also a very robust uh, process of submissions from the fleet. So as Steve was talking about earlier, as a congressman, um, he works with the US uh, constituents to bring submissions to the International Technical Committee and other committees within the ORC and they're adjudicated every fall. And in fact, we're getting right near the uh, deadline for these year's submissions. I think they're due on September 4th, if I uh, understand that correctly, Steve, is, is that correct? Uh, they, they're imminent. Imminent, yeah. So um, the, the other thing is, is that we offer a, something called sailor services that allows you to see your own boat, but also any other boat in the entire fleet. And then you can run test certificates um, of your own boat to see how changes in your measurements might affect your rating. And then lastly, uh, ORC offers a, a number of scoring options uh, some of them single number, multiple number, like three or five. Some of you may be familiar with, if you say on the Northeast, there's a five number scoring system. We have time on distance, time on time. And then we have the polar curve scoring, which is what the ITC generally recommends, which uses the performance of a boat in the class to be used as a barometer to help uh, establish the, uh, the wind speed. So for these reasons, um, uh, there, are, there are similarities to other handicaps, but all of these things combined is really what makes uh, um, uh, ORC uh, special. And, and going back to that uh, description of the sailor services, I think that Austin's actually going to show something about that uh, later in the, uh, in the presentation. Yeah. Next slide. So moving forward, uh, what sales get measured in, Robert? Uh, if someone is looking to get a certificate, what sales do they have to get measured in? And do they have to with both club and international certificates? Yeah, so there's, there's no difference in the way that sales are measured for both certificates. Most of the differences between club and international are related to the measurement of the boat and getting the displacement and the stability right. So tonight we're only going to talk about uh, pedsails and spinnakers, but obviously there are mainsails and a variety of mizzen sails um, that will need to be addressed. But we're going to concentrate tonight on headsails and spinnakers. Uh, and uh, so if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So this is um, a, a little bit of a, a description of, of headsails. Um, Headsails are, are, we use the, the equipment rules of sailing. Uh, we don't 
changed them essentially really uh, very, very much. And Hetzel's, the, uh, the, the, essentially the, uh, the mid-width must be less than 75% of the length of the foot. This is really the, what, what defines a head sole. Now, head soles in this case can be set in two different ways. There's the conventional like Jib or Genoa that's set on the force day, or we have head soles set flying, which is where the luff is not attached to any, uh, it's, there's no uh, sail edge attached to the force day. Um, the, the largest head sole, just like the largest main sole, must be recorded on the certificate. Um, this is a little different for HSFs, as I will explain on the next slide. Yeah. So you... And Robert, I got one quick question in here on the chat from uh, Scott. He said, if your boat has been measured under another rule, can those measurements be used for an ORC certificate? Absolutely. That would be a perfect example. So, for instance, if you, uh, if you have another certificate um, and you have a lot of the information, it's very easy to translate a lot of that stuff over. So even, and so like for instance, if you had a purse certificate, you might be able to use a lot of that information to populate an ORC club certificate. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a process where your boat was measured and in the water measurement for another rating rule, it's possible that that could be used to populate the ORC measurement. And the best way to get the exact answer to that is to probably go to US Sailing and speak to the offshore office so they can look at the measurements that you have and they'll be able to give you an exact answer to that question. Does that address your, does that address the yeah. question? Yeah, thank you. Um, you wanna keep going on Hetzel's here? Once sure. You, yep. So um, uh, we can actually, so we can go on to the next now. We'll talk quickly about uh, spinnaker measurements um, as it's different than a, uh, a Hetzel spinnakers have a half width of 75% or more of the foot length. And I'm not gonna belabor the point about symmetrics and asymmetrics. I think we all know what those differences are. And clearly the largest spinnaker must be recorded on the certificate. But in addition to that, because we handle the way that um, sales that have mid widths between 50% and 85%, how they impact your rating, all spinnakers that are less than the 85% half width also need to be recorded on your certificate. And this is a relatively new thing that's been going on for the last couple of years. It's because we actually look at every sale between 15 and 85% mid-width now, and uh, it, all of those sales individually impact your rating. So we can, we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, and can people run both asymmetrical and symmetricals under ORC? I believe you can. I think you, you can run them both on a pole. And that, uh, depending on what configuration that you declare for your uh, arrangement, that will influence the aerodynamic coefficients associated with that collection of sales. All right. Yeah. So just to make sure that, uh, that we're not missing anyone on this. We've talked a lot about this percentage of mid-width. We want to just make sure that we all understood what we were talking about here. So this is a very nice graphic that very simply describes showing the foot length in blue and the mid-width in red. And so in the case of this, uh, this headsail set flying here, 75% uh, code zero, your foot length's 10, your mid girth seven and a half, that's a 75% mid-width sale. And in the case of the spinnaker on the right, the foot length and the mid girth are the same, which is quite common for an all-purpose spinnaker. And so it's 100% mid-width sale. So just to make sure that there's no confusion uh, on, on that. So we can go to the next slide. Yep. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about specifically about headsail set flying. Um, the HSFs, as we call them, uh, they can be either tacked in front of the floor stay on the, on the sprit, which is quite common, or they can actually, a staysail is also a, a headsail set flying, it's tacked between the floor stay and the mast. And one of the things, when, once we started keeping track of every single HSF, this also allows the flexibility of not only being able to hoist your sail from the very, very tip of the bow sprit, and from the, the hounds or some other position on mass, you can arbitrarily select individual points along the bowsprit or on the mast to accommodate whatever uh, 
Hetzel set flying that you wish to fly. Um, all Hetzel set flying need to be recorded on their certificate. And again, because we're not changing the way that we, uh, the way that sales are measured based on the ERS, or the Equipment Rules of Sailing definition, all the Hetzel set flying between 51 and 74% are measured like a Hetzel. And all the, the HSFs between 75 and 85% are measured like a Spinnaker. And then we do a little bit of special handling in the VPP to make sure that there's a smooth transition as you go from 74.9 to 75.1%. Got it. And uh, just to clear up on the inner sails, do those have to be put on your certificate as well? So you have like a Spinnaker staysail or a Genoa staysail inside of your J point? Would that have to go on as well, or can that just be smaller than your biggest jib and not on your certificate? I believe that at the moment we do not separately account for the speed contribution of the of the inner sails, and so I do not believe that those inner uh, sails have got to be recorded. Okay. So um, the reason that you know I mentioned before that we're keeping track of all of the sails is because. As you can imagine, the aerodynamic performance of a sail like a Genoa is obviously, we all know, quite a bit different than the A2 there on the far right. And so in the case of a Genoa, it goes up wind beautifully and it goes down wind fairly poorly. And the kite doesn't go very close winded and does fantastic downwind. And so if you were to think about the performance of the sail as a function of the wind angle, it varies quite a bit. Now, what we've, what we've discovered and through our collaboration uh, with uh, sail design experts is that essentially there's a very strong relationship between the mid-width ratio of a sail and its sort of close-windedness. And so you can see that the Genoa 50%, that's our close-winded sail, and our A2 spinnaker with 100% mid girth all the way over to the right. And then you can see this collection of different kinds of headsail set flying in between uh, the code 5565, which are relatively close winded, tight reaching sails. You've got your 75 to 85% mid girths, which are um, a broader reaching sail. And then as you move into like an A1, which is a, a relatively tight downwind sail, and then to your true all purpose A2. So, what we do in the rule in the VPP actually is each one of these kinds of sails has a different set of aerodynamic performance. And so if you were carrying a code 55, let's say, you would see that your rating would be impacted in close winded, tight reaching conditions, but really wouldn't be much different than what your A2 could do if it was far from the wind. And vice versa, if you were to carry a code zero at 85% girth, you would see very little or no impact on your tight reaching, but you'd see a big impact on your broad reaching angles, if that makes sense. This is why it's important that they're all on the certificate, because what we do now is we run every single HSF individually in the computer. And then when we compute your rating, we're basically building an envelope of the best of the best of the sales in your inventory. And that way we get a fair assessment so that uh, everyone uh, can uh, can choose the sails that fit their kind of racing and fit their kind of boat. Um, and this is, this is really where then uh, it's important that uh, we've provided the flexibility to pick the right sails for your boat, and now you need to do so wisely. And that's where your sailmaker comes in to help you make those decisions. Yeah. And so transitioning over to matching your inventory to your racing, I'll bring in Steve and John. I'm just gonna answer one question in the chat really fast. Uh, Jim has asked during a long race offshore conditions can change dramatically. How is that handled by the rule? Um, we're gonna go into that a little bit later when we're in the certificate going over the different scoring options that can be used. So we will handle that question uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, so Steve and John, uh, getting into matching your inventory, where would you start, let's say, with an overlapping rig boat, kind of like your, your medium displacement, say like a J35 or maybe a J109, one of those style boats with a 155% Genoa, that era of boat. How would you match your inventory for kind of ORC offshore racing? Well, I think for me, this is kind of like where sailmakers come in and, you know, for any offshore racing, we're kind of 
trying to minimize the inventory um, a bit so that we're not taking, you know, 25 sales out offshore racing with us. And so if you've got that, you know, if you've got that big Genoa, you're already getting an assessment for that Genoa. And so going with one of the smaller um, HSF sales, I think, you know, could be, could, could be not very helpful and you could be more beneficial with, um, you know, an A3 tack to a pole, like Dr. Rob was saying, um, you know, or, or just your sort of standard symmetrical spinnakers. I think, you know, in any of these offshore racing, for me, it's about, you know, building your inventory so that you're, you've got decent overlaps in your sale crossover chart, um, you know, while, while not having to take a ton of sales with you. Okay. So, so for that example of boat, you might take maybe two or three jibs, like a, a 155 and then maybe a number two and a blade and then right. a asymmetrical spinnakers yeah. and leave, leave the code zero at the dock potentially. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, moving on to, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, because that's what the that's what the boats were designed for. I mean, you know, the the newer modern boats have, have gone to the small non overlapping rigs, you know, which is our next bullet point here. Um, you know, especially even some of the race, you know, sort of the cruising boats have gone to, you know, non overlapping jibs that, you know, sort of for light air upwind need, you know, the boat needs that extra horsepower. Yeah, that makes total sense. So as you go into that non-overlapping rig, let's say the example we're using on this one is like maybe a J111 or, or an right. XP44, one of those style of boats, what would that inventory look like? How would it be different from the overlapping rig example mm -hmm. previous? Well, I mean, this is where the HSFs really come into play, um, sort of give that boat, you know, you can carry sort of a, an HSF for light air, um, upwind and and you know minimize how many jibs you take on board um, and then have the asymmetrical spinnakers you know sort of for your downwind inventory um, I think that's where you know trying to decide how big or small to make that HSF it becomes very important we can talk about running trials for that um, later on in the talk got it Okay, and then Steve, we'll bring you in for the non-overlapping kind of lighter add, displacement I just add one thing on the non-overlapping rig that um, it, the, um, the envelope of, the, of the, the rig itself plays a big role in uh, sizing, I think, for these uh, medium to heavy displacement boats. Um, if you end up with sort of the, the wrong mid-width it may not actually be able to get around the rig as closely as what you're hoping for. So I, I think that's a really important attribute that needs to be uh, considered. Yeah, that makes sure. sense. Yep. So Steve, bringing you in on the non-overlapping light displacement boat, I know we've seen all sorts of different configurations with these style boats, like triple headed rigs and big, big A3s and, and all sorts of different uh, types of sails. What are you kind of gearing these boats towards when they're coming at you saying, I need an inventory for this fast, we'll say TP-52 kind of style boat. Um, what, what are they using? Sure. So I'd, I'd like to address that area. And I, in part, it depends on how big the boat is and whether there's room in the four triangle for the triple head rig. But on the 40, there was barely the Carthy 40 spooky. On the 52, Spooky, there was plenty of room and it had an overspread. So we would fly very effectively a jib top uh, from the end of the sprit, a uh, head, head saw, which would um, probably be like a, a J3 or maybe a J4, and then a Genoa staysail on the inner, um, which in the end we made purling. Uh, so the triple head rig for a TP-52 is extremely effective. There's no real penalty for it. Uh, and it works as long as there's enough wind for it, which I would say is over probably 12 knots True. So uh, when you say you had a jib top, what, what, what do you think the mid girth was on that sail? On that? It's, it's, it's the max of our upwind Genoas, right? So um, 
Robert, maybe you know what a typical TP52 mid girth is. It's over 50%. There's a there's a roach penalty. So so the the the, the triple head rig is actually kind of interesting um, in that the 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 HSF that you fly off of the bowsprit is actually a relatively small sail and typically has long pennants. Um, and that's actually handled in a very specific way by the, the ORC because um, if we only accounted for that one sail all by itself uh, operating, um, it would be a very, very small contribution seen. And yet we all know that with all three sails, they're actually working quite effectively. And that's actually what drove us to um, specializing a minimum uh, size of HSF. So even though the sail area of that small jib top is measured, let's say it's, you know, 60 something square feet or a couple hundred square feet, um, we actually, we specify that the minimum area of an HSF is essentially equal to the, uh, um, the uh, sort of the projected area of the four triangle that it would occupy. So it goes all the way to the bowsprit, all the way to, I suspect that's a, 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 is that a hounds or a masthead, that jib top? Masthead, well, masthead. it's got pennants, but it's hoisted to the masthead. Hoisted to the masthead, right. So the minimum size for that one sail would be basically making up that entire forward triangle. And if you think about it though, it's actually very reasonable because if you squint and looked at the boat when it's sailing in that configuration, you have sails filling up that entire four triangle. And that was sort of the, the theory behind it. Okay, good. So from there, we go broader and maybe lighter wind. And the next sail we need is a tweener, uh, which work, I call it a tweener. You can call it a set flying. So that is now a, a real science is deciding how big you want your tweener and how many you want to have uh, in your inventory to pick from, I think you need at least one headsail set flying, a proper, mm -hmm. um, fa fairly large one. And then from there, obviously, you go right through the A's, uh, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, yeah. maybe. Got it. And if we were looking at, say, a, a even bigger boat, like a 72, would they, those boats, would they still carry spinnakers or are they kind of all on the that headsail set flying program, do you think? Yeah. Once you get to the hundred footers, they're all laminate sails because they reach so tight and they have so yeah. much apparent wind. Makes sense. Um, so going forward, uh, Robert, you want to talk about generating a certificate and then I'll actually bring us over to a sample certificate to go through what is on it and what numbers are used when rating your boat. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we talked about sort of the, the ORC international and ORC club certificates earlier. But even within that, there are different categories. So um, ORC uh, offers sort of the regular certificate that you would all would be familiar with. Um, but in, in obviously a lot of enthusiasm and interest in double-handed racing. And so ORC actually does have a special double-handed uh, certificate that handles the displacement of the crew and its impact and, the, and how much impact there's, it has on the stability, handled all of that differently. So there's a double-handed certificate. There's also a non-spinnaker certificate. And then lastly, there are, um, in fact, um, uh, uh, a one, there are one design ORC certificates as well. So the again, going back to um, maintaining the sort of loca local nature of this, the certificates are, are issued by uh, the country's uh, rating office. So uh, if, again, if, you, if you're looking to get an OR certificate, the, the, a great place to start is, is at US Sailing. Um, they have a, a, a section de devoted specifically to ORC to get the whole process started. Um, it takes more than a couple of days. And so uh, if you are thinking about doing the SORC, uh, then there's still plenty of time, but you need to get started as soon as possible to ensure that you get, a, you get your rating sorted and all done and dusted before the events. Yeah. Um, okay. Robert, could you explain what a one design certificate would be? So people who maybe have a one design boat understand how they could obtain one of those compared with any of the other certificates or what the difference might be? 
Sure. So the I think the one design certificate probably would avoid some of the in the water measurements because essentially what you're saying is is that as long as your boat is fully compliant with the one design uh, uh, rules, so it, essentially what most one design rules fix the uh, the the maximum and minimum weights as an example. Uh, so uh, the um, if you have a boat. Uh, and I'm trying to think of a good example, and it's uh, not coming to me at the moment, but there no, are like a, a J111 or a J35. Yeah, so I, I have to, I don't know if those are the kinds of one design boats that they're talking about or whether it's smaller one designs. Um, it also depends on how tightly uh, bound the one design rules are and if their boats are sort of kept in check through the one design process. Um, J35s is an example, the, you know, the displacements of J35s varies all over the map. And so they probably would not be a very good candidate for a one design certificate, if that makes sense. The um, IC37 has one, for example. There you go, right, because they're, because the construction of the boats is carefully regulated. There's a very, uh, the boats are checked to make sure they're compliant with the class rules, that kind of thing. So that's an excellent example of a, a one design ORC certificate. Got it, thank you, thank you. So I'm going to exit out here and jump into a sample certificate. Um, Robert, you want to explain, say, starting with GPH, what that number is, and we'll kind of go from there down the certificate and what people are looking at here. Sure. So um, the certificate, the, a standard international certificate um, has four pages. This first page is a bunch of general information. Uh, up in the upper right hand corner there, there are four numbers. APH is the all purpose handicap which is an equal mix of all sailing angles and a distribution of wind. And in absence, uh, no, that's APH above. No, oh, APH right. above it, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so the, the GPH, um, as you can imagine, ORC has been around for an awfully long time. And we oftentimes, we make um, improvements. And yet there's also, there are a lot of people who hang on to sort of the good things from the past. And so at the moment, we believe that this all-purpose handicap if you're gonna only use one number, doesn't depend on the course, doesn't depend on the wind speed, this is the best, our best measure of a boat's all purpose performance. The GPH is really, uh, is falling behind in importance to us, but it's maintained on the certificate for mm -hmm. reference purposes. And yeah, as the number gets bigger or smaller, does the boat get faster? Just so people know, like, so say, 518 versus 450, which boat would be faster in that? So the, the 450 is, uh, it's, this is faster. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So then those the seed. Are, those are right. seconds per mile. Uh, so they, that's a, that's a time on distance type of approach, right? So if you're comparing yeah. your boat to another, it'd be like a time on distance. Correct. Awesome. Thanks guys. So then, um, the, the CDL is a class division length. And it's meant to try to give race organizers and people sort of a sense of the size of the boat and the speed potential, particularly upwind. And so it's essentially an average of the effective sailing length of the boat, plus our predicted sailing length of the boat at 12 knots upwind. And the CDL is, as it said, class division length, is largely intended to be used um, to set up class splits. And so, for instance, if you go to the uh, ORC internationals, um, all of the class splits are determined by CDL. So it's not a very meaningful measurement in terms of comparing your boat to another boat. Um, like when you're talking about going around the race course, it's principal use is for, uh, is for class, class uh, breaks. Okay. Okay. And then um, we've recently introduced this um, sort of really pretty detailed drawing of the boat. Um, to kind of give people and and your competitors sort of an idea of like what it is that you've got going on with uh, with your boat. Um, so there's the the picture there, and then there's some general information about the boat, um, the age and series date, which is important because that influences the age allowance, which is just uh, listed in that next group under hull. Um, the uh, each year you get an age allowance of. 0.03% to 0.325%, and that affects uh, your rating. So as time gets goes on, your boat will get slower and slower compared to a brand new boat. Um, the other term that someone had asked me about earlier was dynamic allowance. Dynamic allowance is intended to 
Um, you know, I was telling you earlier about the VPP, basically it's this big force balance, but that's all forces that are steady state forces. Um, we all know that boats tack and jibe and some boats tend to do that better than others. And so dynamic allowance is intended to try to make an estimate of the uh, potential of, um, of uh, how your boat, whether it tends to tack quickly or tack slowly and have that added in in a, in a manner to give some credit for the boats that tack slowly. So the dynamic allowance uh, is listed there. Um, dynamic allowance is mostly available for cruiser racers. It's not available for high performance boats uh, unless that boat is over 30 years old. So if you have a, an IOR boat from the, from the hinterlands and it doesn't have a beautiful cruiser in, interior, um, but it, uh, it can still get a dynamic allowance like a cruiser racer does. And to be considered a cruiser racer, you have to meet all of the accommodation requirements that are described in one of the appendices uh, in the IMS rule. So going down a little description of the propeller, um, some description of the crew weight, which you can uh, select yourself if you have a big crew or a small crew. Yes, Steve? That's a super important uh, criteria. If you're not at the maximum, it really behooves you to declare uh, what you uh, actually do weigh. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the crew weight affects the displacement of the boat. It also affects the, uh, the, the sail carrying capacity of the boat. And so if you are regularly not sailing uh, essentially at your max weight, you should definitely take advantage and drop that down to what it is that you uh, typically do. So then the next uh, thing there is a collection of sail areas. Um, you can see, uh, interestingly enough, on this certificate, um, so the, the headsail uh, and the headsail set flying, their measured and rated numbers are identical, which is fairly typical. Although, as we talked earlier about in Steve's case, that HSF, that triple head rig sail, you would see its measured size being relatively small and its rated area being different than that because of these defaults. The reason that the mainsail is as a difference between measured and rated is because, again, we were saying that there's a lot of legacy in these certificates. And the, the formula that's used for the measured um, in this particular document is left over from 2010. But the rated one is the new, the new formula that we use on a regular basis. So it's very typical to see a slight difference between measure, mainsail measured and rated, but the rated is the correct number and it's related directly to your sales as they were measured when it put through the proper formula. Uh, and then what you see below the, the drawing of the boat is actually the outputs directly from the VPP. Um, of the rated boat velocities. And this is an important aspect of, the, of essentially the way that we do handicapping in ORC. We don't create handicaps first. We predict the speed of the boat. And from those, we construct handicaps. So it's all about this physics-based, science-based, objective, transparent process of predicting the speed of the boat that is the starting point. So these are the rated boat velocities you can see that it's uh, set up from six to 20 knots. It has the um, optimum BMG and then a handful of angles uh, and then the optimum downwind angle. All right, so then page two of the certificate, this is the scoring options. Now the, that first page is essentially the same over the entire world. In the, on the second page, most of this is specialized to the U.S. sailing market. Um, so uh, through the submission process and through the, the, the U.S. sailing, it's, these have been the scoring options that are printed on all U.S. sailing issued sailing certificates. And so here um, we see a, a couple of, if you go just back up just a little bit, Austin, um, you can see these single number scoring options. Um, I think everyone understands, you know, windward lured, that's a 50-50 break. Um, and then we do it at uh, different wind speeds. Um, and because that's a single number scoring option, that actually is a combination of a bunch of different wind speeds and averaged over that. So it's a combination of a little bit at six, a little bit at eight, a little bit at 10, 30% at 12, and then a little bit more at 20. 
And then we also translate that um, to give people the option right off the certificate of doing time on distance or time on time uh, to uh, give everyone the, uh, the best opportunity. So then in addition to that, um, in the US, there's a lot of enthusiasm for um, triple number, which is you take the, um, the, uh, a, a basically a collection of wind speeds um, over uh, the lower portion of the range. So a triple number uses 50% at six knots and 50% at eight. And then the high triple number uses 25% at 14 and then splits it evenly between 16 and 20. And again, we translate it into time on distance and time on time. And then finally, uh, in New England, they wanted the five band system. And so we see that over there uh, on the far right. Um, now we've talked mostly, so the, we've got the all purpose, which is a, a good potential choice for a, a, a long distance race. Obviously windward lewards, um, that's good for course racing. There are other uh, scoring options here that are appropriate for distance races. So, so for instance, the predominantly upwind or the predominantly downwind, that's the single number version there and, and the sort of the no, no shading. You can take that same course content and turn it into a low, medium, high, triple number approach. Um, and the same for downwind. And then finally, a small number of very significant races that have uh, made efforts to work with ORC. We've actually worked with the, uh, the, the, uh, the race organizers to build custom course content uh, and wind speed content and then they select from those three. So as an example, Chicago Bank uh, gives a, a predominantly upwind race, an all-purpose race, and a, and a downwind race. And then the wind speeds are distributed through that. And it comes up with, in this case, it looks like it's a time on distance uh, approach. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Robert, in the chat, we have the question of, which we knew we were going to get, is of when do you decide the rating? Do you do it before or after the race? What are, so what are is, race yeah. organizers doing typically? Yeah, so this is the great conundrum. Um, and every approach seems to, to, you know, there are ups, there are pros and cons to each of the choices. So the great thing about choosing ahead of time is that everybody knows from the moment they leave the starting line, they can look at another boat and you can tell exactly for as far as, if you're doing time on distance at least, or time on time, you can pretty much uh, know how you're doing pretty easily right there and then. Um, the downside is that if you get it wrong, uh, you have no recourse. If, there's, if the winds change significantly during the race, then you're stuck with your choice before you got started. Um, so uh, I think you know for short races, it's probably, it makes sense to try to do before because you're not gonna be sailing for that much longer. So that's not, I mean, not so unreasonable. Um, the, but for a long distance race, I think sometimes it, it depends on the, the, the area uh, that you're racing and the, local, and the conditions during that week. Um, it may make sense to name them ahead of time because of the advantage of knowing how you're doing. If you have a reasonable expectation that the wind forecast is looking very solid, if the wind forecast was looking pretty fluky, that might be a good reason to wait until after the race is complete and then uh, use a variety of mechanisms uh, to determine the wind speed. If you were to ask an ORC ITC member, they would tell you that their recommendation is to use what we call polar curve scoring, where we get the course content right, and then we look at how long it took you to do the race, and then essentially we back compute what the wind speed must have been during the race for that boat to have finished at that in that amount of time. And we believe that this is the, the most objective and fair approach that uh, takes a lot of judgment and uh, you know people consideration out of the mix. Does that address your question? Yeah, I, th I think it does. I think obviously race organizers are gonna have to figure out what they want to do for their individual regattas, but it's good to know what options they have that are out there and what sailors you know how, how sailors are knowing that the the rating is being picked yeah there's there's uh, plenty of options and I, I think the real key is that uh is is communication between the race organizers and the constituents uh in the end it, there's 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 
there's no perfect way. And so it's important that there's at least broad consensus among everyone about uh, how to make it work the best. Yeah. And then as we get into these final pages. So the third again... page is basically uh, an incredibly uh, complete set of the detailed measurements that are performed during the, um, during the measurement process. Um, I'm not really sure that there's anything specifically worth noting sure. there. But if we go to the next page, the fourth page, this is where you'll see the, uh, the sails that are declared and measured on the boat. So uh, you can see here, there's only one mainsail because it's the largest mainsail and that's the only one that needs to be declared on the certificate. And the same thing with the asymmetrical spinnaker, only the largest spinnaker over 85% mid-width ratio needs to be declared. Um, the, on the headsails, you can see that there are two headsails on this boat. There's the J2A, which is your J, your, your, your basically your J2 upwind uh, jib. And it's your largest jib, apparently. And so it's declared. It's not a headsail set flying. But then you have a 68% code sail on this boat. It has all of the, the mid widths across the, you have the, uh, the top, the upper, the three quarter, the half, the quarter and the LP and the left length, it's a flying sail. And so this boat, because it sits in that, that range between 50 and 85%, it has to be declared and, and put here so that it can be properly assessed and can influence those speed predictions that we saw earlier. And let's say if someone had a 75% a Midgar sail, it would still show up here. It would just show up below the A2 down here, right? It would show up in the asymmetric asymmetric spinnaker category. If it was over, let's say if it's a let's say if it's a 76% sale, because that makes it a little easier, then yes, it would Drop. it would fall under, it would be, it would show up on this page. And it would show up with a Luff leech uh, foot in half width as opposed to having these measurements. Exactly, because because it's 76%, according to the equipment rules of sailing, by definition, it's a spinnaker. Yeah. Even though we handle it we handle the way it influences the speed of the boat as an HSF. Got it. And what we wanted to show everyone as well is within the sailor services, what they can do. Um, if they want to run a test certificate on their own boat, if they want to look up a competitor's boat, if they have a question on a sailor to competitors using, you can just go to the ORC website. You can run into search certificates. Um, this boat, we can just look up by sale number. And then all you have to do is add them to your boats, little plus sign. And then if you, you can run a test certificate on your own boat, you can even run test certificates on, on any boat in the system if you choose, just with as long as you have enough credits to run it. Um, you can go in and edit your data and measurements. And most people will probably just be playing with the sails or maybe their crew weight for the most part. And it's in this section in which you could actually run a test certificate. Um, I can run, run real fast. I'll just drop the mid curve or the half width down a little bit. It's obviously not going to be a fair curve, but we'll just do it just for demonstration purposes. And I will run a test certificate just so you guys can see what that looks like. And when you guys are doing this, you can obviously also work with your sail maker and, and have him give you guidance on what dimensions to run and what the test certificate actually shows you. I think that's the biggest point of this is as you're building your inventory, really you wanna work closely with your sail maker on what sales are adding to the inventory and what it's gonna to do to your rating. And Austin, my understanding, unlike some other uh, uh, approaches, you are essentially are allowed to run as many of these test certificates as you please, and you can, and as you're willing to pay for, for Correct. credits, as opposed yeah. to being limited to some small number a year, because I mean, that's the way people try to suss out, as it were, the secret formulas is by running trial certificates and some other, other things, as opposed yeah. to just being able to do it or look at the yeah. BPP documentation and figure it out for themselves. Yeah. And looking at this certificate, Robert, I guess the real big difference, obviously, is it, it says test, so it's not a valid certificate for racing. Sure. 
Um, is there any other differences that we're really going to see here? As we I don't, look I don't it? believe so. I mean, I think you see your cert number. It looks like it. That's that is not a real cert number. I'm not sure how it generated it, but the, the test basically makes it clear that it's not. Mm -hmm. and, and up in the upper right hand corner, you can see is not for racing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can see the G, the APH went down a little bit. The GPH went down just a little bit. I'm sure some of these numbers changed some yeah, so as we, they so should have. What we should see um, would be essentially, so by going to a, a smaller midwit, what you should see is that you're like these, these broader angles at like 120 and 14 knots, that kind of thing. You should be a little slower there and you should be a little faster at the tight reaching angles conceptually. Steve, you had a point? Yeah, I just want to point out that this is a really useful research tool and you don't only have to play with your boat, you can get any of your competitors boats. So let's try say we're trying to optimize a TP52. I would go and look at um, several of the other ones, Vesper in those days or whichever the boat was to study, maybe Fox, I just pull their ORC certificate out of sailing services. I go for their valid one because I don't see their test ones. I don't think, unless uh, Robert can answer that. Do you see test certificates that other people run? So that someone else has run on your boat. I don't, I don't think you see those. I yeah, think I, I haven't been able when, to. When you, when you purchase it on your own run, it's to you and, and it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't get loaded up in some global test fleet database, which then you can download other people have done. So no, it's, uh, it's, it's up to you to do your own boat or, or your own boats. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they still get the, I guess the ratings are a little different down here. You don't get the full menu that you get on a real certificate. It yeah. It looks like, like, yeah. So that's a good point. looks like in here in this test certificate, you get the time allowances for the main, and this is partly because what you see right here, this is the, the one constant for everywhere in the world. And then all the other scoring options are unique. Um, it is possible uh, with a little bit of math. And if you open up the, the documentation that's available, you can, there, there's nothing keeping you from calculating all of those other course cons, all those other ratings from this information though. And then the rest is still similar. That would be identical. Time. And then yeah. you would see the difference now is that your code 68, you change the HHW, which is over there sort of around the middle to 4.95. Yeah, exactly. And then it should say, um, yeah, it didn't, doesn't show the ratio, but it, it, yeah, so it, it will. Uh, and so, you know, not only does the size of the sale change, but because the, the performance of, of HSF is essentially dictated by the midwit, the aerodynamic coefficients that we're using in the BPP are literally different for this sale than for that 68% sale, because we know that it's a little bit better close-winded and a little bit weaker in the broad angles. So just a, just a quick question, Robert, to, to clarify for everyone, you're only rating the largest HSF and you can have more than one because we need it for stasels, right? So notwithstanding the stasels, all HSS that are declared um, are all, they're all run in the BPP. So if you carry, if they, so for instance, if you carry a close winded HSF and a broad winded HSF, then you would see the performance increases in both the tight angles because you have that close winded HSF and in the broad winded angles because you have the broad HSF. And so we run all of the sales and then if you imagine there's like a performance envelope for each sale individually, and then you drew a line that went through like the best of the best at every different wind angle, that would become the performance envelope for your boat based on that unique characteristics of that combination of HSFs and their size. Does that address your question? Yeah. Well, I, I think it clarifies that there, you're likely going to get penalized if you carry more than one. Well, so I guess it depends. I would offer that you're not being penalized, you're being assessed. And the reason that you would carry more than one is because you have some reasonable expectation that uh, you anticipate seeing both broad angles and 
relatively tight ones. And so if you do a lot of distance racing, um, you know, it, it's quite likely that in fact, that'll be the case. Um, if you only do a little bit of distance racing and you have a very, very strong collection of like, let's say you have a, an A3 and an A2 and an A1, you don't need a lot of help at the broad reaching angles and you might be a good candidate for getting a tight winded sail and not carrying a second HSF. If you only have one or two kites, then it might actually make sense for you to have both because um, HSFs, the broad winded HSFs are also great heavy air sails and could be a, a better a better sail selection choice, for instance, than an A5 because it does everything an A5 does, um, but it's also easier to handle because it's on a furler. How does it know that it's a staysail? So the, the, the staysails, generally speaking, don't affect the, the inner staysail doesn't affect your handicap. And a spinnaker staysail with a roach? So the spinnaker staysail um, does not impact your rating bonds it's on the inner four stack. What if you set it from the end of the pole? If you set it from the end of the pole, then it's a head sole set flying, and then it would be affected. That's why there's that, that uh, if, when you went, if you go back to this, you don't need to do it, but if, if on the slide where we were talking about HSF, there's essentially a flag that is either an inner HSF or not. It's either inside the force day or not inside the force day. Thank you. Yep. So bringing it back to the talk here now, before we run out of time, um, these are some dates for everyone if they're in these areas where you can get your sales measured, where we blocked off times at these different lofts, um, where you can get your sale measured on the spot. So if you're in the Annapolis area, come in here in the next uh, next few days and get your sale measured. And we have uh, dates in Charleston, St. Pete, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami, hopefully all leading us into an awesome winter racing season in the SORC. And so just a reminder for everyone, these are your SORC race dates. And we hope anyone who can get down there for the winter and spend some time in the sunshine can do so with their boat. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, you can bring them up now. Steve, you have something else you want to add? Uh, I, I just wanted to say we scheduled our sale measurement uh, two days to be kind of the last chance uh, before the SORC. And it's cutting it real close. If you're planning to do the SORC, I would try not to leave it until then, but we will do our best to accommodate you in Miami. And um, it'll be up to everyone else uh, in the administration to process it, but we'll be there to do it. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, does anyone else have any questions in the chat? Um, I'm going to go ahead and just bring it up to our emails as well. So if anyone has any specific emails, questions, they can also email the three of us here at North Sales also. Um, so awesome. I think that. an important part in the sale measurement is as we see sales get a little bit older, they get smaller. And so this is an easy way to sort of get your sales checked, get the boat measured and, and you know, take advantage of, you know, an easy thing to measure to affect your rating certificate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's kind of one of those really easy things to do if you're planning on doing some SORC racing, even if you have the same sales, it, it's, it's worth getting them remeasured, getting them checked in because you, you may see it affect it. And there was a little bit of chat on the on the group chat about, you know, the difference between one design club and international certificates and how those things are measurements measured and ORC definitely encourages the boats to get measured for an international certificate because it will help it will help your rating. Um, just knowing those those measurements precisely um, can make a big difference. Here in Charleston, we had two um, one design Malgus 32s with class sails, and one boat got measured and one boat didn't. And the boat that got measured, uh, the boat that didn't get measured, ended up owing the other boat 40 or 50 seconds every race, and that was a pretty significant amount. Um, for two boats that are really meant to be very identical. Uh, Austin, for the group, uh, do we have a policy on the sale measurement days? Are the, the measurements free or $10 a sale or is there, is there any set um, guidelines? I think it's up to each individual loft. Um, I know we're 
Ridgely here has a, a rate that he will uh, let the customer know that day. Um, and I think it's probably just going to be depending on which which loft you're at, what what that sale measurement is going to cost. Um, so not a, I think not a lot, fair. though. It's not no, not a lot. Either. Just just a little bit to cover the time. Yep. And you said it's a huge, hugely payoff investment because if most sales shrink a little tiny bit. And so if you think about all those different measurements a little bit smaller and you get a square foot of sale area, that's going to have a direct impact on your rating. Mm -hmm. In Charleston, for if you can make it during the measurement days, we're going to do it for free, but just during those measurement days. Awesome. We'll we'll do the same in Miami. Well, thank you so much for joining us, guys, uh, and taking time out of your evening to do this. Uh, again, there'll be a recording of this talk as well. If anyone wants to go back and rewatch it or pick up on something, uh, it'll be available on YouTube. It generally takes about a day or two to get up on YouTube, but it will be up there definitely by the end of the week. And so with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and uh, end the talk. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.